Um, so that's me in Ethiopia, International Story Gathering, uh, which is what we're going to talk to you about today, uh, largely for INGOs and other organizations. And why we're talking about it, you might be used to a lot of content design -y chats. Well, I would say it is it is a part of content design. Content design isn't, as we know, just a few buttons on a page. It might be that you'll be creating an editorial story-led strategy. Uh, a lot of organizations rely on this content because you want your users to participate. You want to reassure them. You want to satisfy their need to help and support something. And you might facilitate that as part of your content design too. So this is basically some observations on how you might want to go about uh, story gathering. I'm going to talk largely internationally. A lot of these principles will apply for any UK organizations or any story gathering that you might be doing for your organization. Uh, let's see if I can click and will it move forward? I'm on a different, I'm on two laptops. So uh, let's see what happens to my slides. Um, so when people say, oh, what do you do as a story gatherer? Very similar to content designers. I basically just say, I do the things that you see on a screen. So that might be stories, it might be films, words, images, photography. You pretty much name it, animation, audio slideshows, podcast, someone like me will have done it. Uh, and this is a list of the organizations I've worked for. I'm currently at BT, I do a lot of other things but the majority of my story gathering work would be at Comic Relief, which everyone knows and either loves or hates, uh, and VSO International, which a lot of your parents might know, but is still uh, quite a prominent organization today. And most recently at Q, uh, which we did content design and content production for the storytelling of their horticultural work, as well as designing the platforms that you have. Um, so what is, what is international story gathering? It is what I think uh, a collecting practice and packaging practice, looking at stories of impact, largely through personal experience, but also some facts, uh, focusing on tangible solutions by organizations and partners, and in this case, around the world. It's very centered on the human element. The idea being that you bring people together through stories and the idea that you might get someone in Ipswich to sort of connect with someone in Kinshasa and you do that either through a very jarring story which really shocks someone and makes them think oh my god I didn't know that or you do it through connection like motherhood or education. Uh, myself, I've been to over 44 countries, half of them largely doing this, some of them on holiday. Uh, I've worked on most of the human issues around the world. I've done LGBTQ, poverty, disability, abuse, health, war, climate change, disasters. Um, if you Google me, my name won't be on most things because that's what the best things are always like. You sign your life away when you work for organizations and the things with my name on it probably aren't that good. Um, I should caveat this that obviously there's a global pandemic and so this sort of work stopped a couple of years ago and now I'm purely on content design at BT, uh, which is actually how I came across this group. Um, but as I said, you're designing content in very much a literal sense, you're making it fit to objectives and needs and I'll touch on that in a second and a lot of these learnings should still hold true today. Well, we'll see what happens in a COVID world. Um, so why is telling stories important? I've touched on that. It's expensive. So a lot of organizations might say the dreaded words, oh, I'll just grab it when I'm out there. Uh, it is a professional skill to talk to people and it's quite an honor to get them to share their story and package it up appropriately. That's linking about things like ethics and consent. And like I said, it, it is an investment. So any story gathering can cost anything from a couple of hundred pounds to a, a quick photo shoot to 25,000 pounds if you're hiring in a really pro uh, group of people. Uh, a lot of places will decide to invest in house. That's where I got a lot of my job roles. Uh, it is cheaper. And then you have sort of more control on the output and your intellectual property. And why do it at all? Well, content brings in absolutely millions, that's comic relief on the screen, uh, whether it is a public appeal, a sort of private trust, government funding, funding bodies, a text donation, it's what make people believe in the brand that they're supporting. It's a very emotive user group and the outcomes are very tangible. So the people who are giving you this money, even if they are a private funding body, they're also people too and they're reading issues every day and they'll expect stories to sort of justify the spend. Uh, and by that, it is a proof of action. Money does work. It does change people's lives, particularly if it's spent properly. And even if your story might be something very short, like 10 tents were built with this money, it's still a story and it still proves that the money worked. Uh, when I say it's more than a picture, it's because it is a form of an emotional, I don't want to say manipulation, but an emotional way of gathering uh, an audience to participate in whatever form that looks like. So it can take many different forms and it inspires them to do something with the story that they've seen. 
And stories are super important because people remember them. They're part of your news. They're part of what you might share down a pub. Uh, they're in social media. They're in letters that people share with each other. They are the thing that people remember more than some facts. So it's a super powerful tool that often doesn't get enough credit, I think. Uh, transparent use of aid pretty obvious and empowering. So this is quite a controversial statement because a lot of stories can be very disempowering. And it's really important when you're looking at story to think about how it's being told, who's telling it, sort of reading the room and how it's being produced. We're not really in that world anymore where you can just sort of lazily sit and talk about someone that you've met once, uh, which a lot of celebrities have been known to do. Um, people, that sort of voice to the voiceless statement doesn't really work anymore because people have voices and they certainly know how to use them. They've got social media and all these different platforms. So part of a storyteller's role is really about facilitating the way for them to tell the story themselves. A lot of that imagery you might see is changing. Some of it, the sort of flies on eyes, you probably won't see anymore, though I will say it's quite difficult to film in some of these countries without flies. Uh, but some you will still see, and there's lots of different reasons for that. So where do they go? Oh, go back a slide. Uh, they go everywhere. So the most obvious one is obviously fundraising appeals. Uh, they also go in annual reports, like everyone's favorite thing. Uh, they go in your marketing campaigns, they go in recruitment campaigns, they go on social, they go in behavioral change campaigns, they go in press, uh, they win awards, they're shown at super high profile events. A lot of royals have seen some of the stuff that I've done. They work really hard and they can go really far if you've done properly. And because of that investment, when you're doing any kind of story gathering, it makes sense to make it work for as many different outlets as you possibly can. So you'll often go out with a brief and I'll touch on that in a second as well, but it makes sense to add to that and think, how can I get this to do lots of different things? That also makes sense. Um, what do those stories sort of look like? Well, they're very development led in this case. Uh, like I've said, they focus on the human interest element. They can be longer than something like a tweet or they can be super short. They usually in this context showcase the work of your NGO or organization at the center of it. Uh, the idea bringing that you bring a global or, uh, story to a localized audience. Uh, you often, if you want to make it powerful, might link it to a current affair. So at the moment, obviously, COVID's a really big one. Refugees and migrants are a very big one. Uh, climate change is huge. And development stories tend to be focused on something quite long term and quite tangible solutions, whereas disaster stories can be quite short term, again, tangible, but more immediate solutions like blankets and medicine. Uh, something more sustainable might be around infrastructural change that you have to try and make look a bit sexy because no one knows what those words mean. Um, the story, I mean, half of these stories I've done, some I just thought were very cool. Uh, I would take a little notice if you can, I can always send these slides around on the sorts of words are being used. They're very powerful words. Um, getting mothers to school rather than uh, out of school mothers. That's quite important. I think these little nuances. Fighting domestic violence rather than just domestic violence in Sierra Leone. Uh, the action aid one, which I hope you can see, but there's a lot of floating heads over that bit <laughs> on the far bit of the screen. Uh, that probably, probably looks more like something you've, you've been used to a few years ago, but actually the wording has changed and it's all about what she wants rather than what she doesn't have. Uh, and I think that's a really interesting nuance. So like I said, good news spreads. So the more positive you can make these, uh, the more I think they can go a lot further, but there is a place for the bad news story too. So how do you go about it? So um, a lot of people will say, let's just make a film, uh, which, you know, sometimes that is the right answer and sometimes it isn't. But like most content design things, you don't start with a solution, you start with the problem and the needs. So user needs mapping, still do it, a variation of it, more audience focused. Um, so you look at who your audience is, what do they read? How are they gonna see it? If it's a film, are they gonna see it on social media? Do you need to think about the fact their attention span is short? Uh, are they looking for something to do with this information? Do they wanna, participate in some way? Is it debate? Is it donate? Um, are they watching Celebrity Bake Off? And this is a film that's being shown in the adverts. Do they read Good House Housekeeping, which I always say is an example, but don't knock it. It brings in a lot of money whenever you do a charity thing in there. You'd also map out your business needs. So that is things like deliverables, outputs, objectives, uh, how many items of things you need to come back by, uh, come back with, and where are they going to live? Again, if you're making a film, you need to think a bit cleverly about how it's going to be used. Uh, if you're making some stories, you might come back with a baseline case study and then piece it up into a series of tweets, a series of short nuggets that sit 
alongside a magazine uh, article. You think about where it's going and you think a lot about what do you want someone to do, see and feel having seen this piece of work. Um, a lot of people think if you just put it out there, they will come. It doesn't work that way. Now they've read this story, they might want to, you might want to sort of capitalize on that emotion. Donate's a really obvious one, but it could be sign a petition, it could be join the conversation. There's a lot of things that you can do with these stories. So once you've done your user needs mapping, then it comes to planning the thing. So that user needs mapping will probably turn it into some sort of brief, uh, which will be a long list of wish list items of things that you might want to do and come back with. Um, and you just take them off as you go along. Uh, you find your people. So who are the case studies that you're going to need to talk to on the ground? So they could be someone who's had a lived experience. They could be project workers who've got a really interesting perception. Uh, then you come back with the items that you might want. So photos are arguably the most well-used assets, I think. They're very powerful and they can tell a story very well. So you might want to invest in that quite a lot more than people think they do. Again, you do get a casual, I'll take a few pics when I'm out there. Uh, I would argue you try and get a proper photographer who can sit and that is the full purpose of their position when they're on a trip. Uh, you think about film, like I've said, both photos and films, you need to think about what you're going to, how you're going to archive it afterwards, where you're going to keep it, how you're going to store it, how you're going to share it. Uh, written case studies, if they're digital, think about how people are going to get to them. You might have a well-used blog, but you might be thinking, oh, I'll put this into a marketing email instead, in which case the format will look very different. Uh, you might have a template for that. You might think, oh, it's quite easy. Just We just fill in the blanks, which is quite a useful way of structuring a storyline. Uh, if you're thinking about audio, you might want to think about your platform, about where you're going to play it. And you might want to pick people who suit all those different story uh, outputs. Uh, obviously, as everyone knows, it seems like, a, well, I say obviously, maybe everyone does know, uh, best speakers trump and best stories trump people who think that they should be the best people and best stories. You really need to do a lot of digging, maybe working with your project workers or local people on the ground to find the most articulate person who can bring what you're trying to tell to life. Uh, find your angle. I'll talk about this separately, but this is all the different components a story might need to have. Find your locations. Uh, that is a huge bit of planning, particularly in the world today, because you need to do a lot of logistics. And then your trip timelines, the who, where, what, when. Uh, when do you need it by is possibly the most important question because you need to work backwards from when you need your delivery the post-production that comes after you've come back from your trip, the trip length itself, and then the two to eight weeks that it might take to plan a trip because visas and permits are very difficult to get in some parts of the world. And a lot of people think, oh, we'll just swing in with a camera kit and camera kit can get impounded. So where you can get a film permit, you absolutely should. Okay, next. So some of those things I've checked, uh, I've checked off, but when you're looking at when, uh, it's not just time of year, but things like weather, elections, strikes. If you think about Uganda right now, actually all the schools have been closed for nearly 18 months, so you probably can't really film there at the moment. Pandemics. Uh, local holidays, national holidays, saints holidays, daylight times. So a lot of places won't ensure you if you drive after dark, so you'll need to know sunrise and sunset. And then post-production, what else is there in your sort of team's capacity that you have to deliver at the same time, and when would it make sense to go? Uh, weather's a super interesting one as well because you have to do a lot of localized knowledge as to when things like dry seasons and wet seasons are. Uh, where, like I've mentioned, look at logistics, travel time between locations because traffic is always worse than you think it is. You need to map out your hotels, hospitals, uh, where has power for you to charge things, which is a very detailed thing to start <laughs> telling people, but a lot of people might be interested to know that there's a lot of work that goes into story gathering. The who. The who is really important. I was quite strict on who came on trips because a lot of uh, supporting staff back at the office wanted to come and sort of see the work firsthand. Uh, filming is very difficult. It's very cumbersome and not everyone likes a camera pointed in their face, particularly if it's a quite uh, a traumatic experience. So you don't need 15 people from marketing sat behind you sort of learning. You can organize bespoke trips for that separately. Uh, but for a film crew, keep it very tight because it's definitely a job and not a jolly. Um, when you're picking your crew, it's really important to pick people who you can work with. There are fantastic, really talented photographers, film specialists, directors out there, but actually when they're hot and they're tired and they're thirsty and they're not feeling well because they've eaten something they probably shouldn't, uh, you need to have people who can not only still do the job, but still keep a really good face on them. Uh, again, you are 
potentially interviewing people who have been through quite traumatic experiences. So you might want to have a bit of empathy as to what uh, actual discomfort might look like. Uh, you need to make sure you have on the ground support. So that might be a fixer, it might be drivers, it might be translators. Translators are so important. And if you can afford them in the budget, you should. The reason being, uh, when you get back to the UK or wherever it is that you're going and you have all these film rushes, your translator might have just said, yeah, 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 they said X. And then you find out they haven't said X, they haven't answered the question and whatever subtitles you've put on are completely wrong, which is very disempowering as well as really embarrassing. Um, security, not a lot of places need a lot of security, depending on how uh, cautious your uh, risk assessments are. <laughs> a lot of places are a lot safer than you think they are. However, you might be a group of Western people turning up in a four by four to a re remote village with a bunch of expensive equipment. So you'd be a bit sensible and tell, uh, ask a lot of local staff what they think is appropriate, because equally turning up with security might send the very wrong message. And then planning the length of a trip, uh, given logistics as well, I estimate around one day per story, better than to uh, casually overestimate than underestimate some of the time when you get there. Uh, there are a few customs that you might have to follow, about 100 people you need to meet, uh, and you have to do it. If you don't do it, it sends a very, very, very bad message to that community and people won't participate in what you're doing. Um, so plan for a lot of handshaking, maybe not anymore, but uh, a lot of being respectful of local traditions and doing research on that as well. So as well as all the obvious things that I've mentioned before, customs and traditions might impact your dress code, how you greet people, whether you can or can't touch them, what things, and when I say touch them, I mean things like handshakes, uh, whether you need to be chaperoned if you're with a woman and you've got a male camera person. Things like wearing glasses can be put off putting in some cultures, particularly if you're speaking to someone face to face. So doing a lot of research in that will help you prepare to get the best story out of someone. I always think it's very helpful to learn some uh, language before you go out there, some hellos, goodbyes and maybe a joke. It usually goes down very well. Uh, and the more that you can warm someone up by saying you've made an effort to learn a bit about who they are and where they're from, you will uh, probably get a really good story out of it. Um, Underpinning all of this, you'll be working with someone on the ground, like a fixer capacity who will help facilitate this trip, put everything in writing and repeat everything because it's very easy for people to say, yes, yes, it'll all happen. And it has happened where I've shown up and things haven't been where they're supposed to and I'm you know, several thousand miles away and there's nothing you can do about it. So as much preparation as possible as you can and as generous as they will be with their time and their opinions, listen to them and they probably have some really good insights, but also take it with a pinch of salt because you know what good story is and what you need to come back with. Tools, just a quick checklist of things, just, you know, they might be useful for anyone going on a long trip. Uh, visas, obviously, copies of your passport, photocopies, take loads of them. Uh, permits, letters, or press cards if you need them, they can get you into places and hide them if they'll get you out of places. Uh, your itinerary shouldn't just be a list of times, it should be a one-stop information shop of everything that you need, addresses, contacts, you can get your brief check shot list, whatever you want to call it, checklist, map it to each day that you might want to get things, a question list, so if you're a seasoned interviewer you might think that you don't need one, but if you're meeting the briefs of people back in the office it's quite helpful diplomatically to agree a list of questions so they can have an expectation of the content you might be coming back with. And then if you don't get those answers, you can sort of explain why rather than I forgot. Um, call sheets, that's a classic thing of just any filming crew will have, which is a list of contacts, you know, including not just the people in the back at camp, uh, base camp, but also the people on the in the trip. It will also include insurance, hospitals and emergency contact details, which you definitely, definitely need. And then some top fun tips to take with you. Pens, because you lose them and they dry out in the heat. Uh, recording device because you'll lose the pens, uh, a notebook for when you don't lose the pens, and as many consent forms as you think you need, triple them because consent is very, very important, which I think might be my next slide. Um, Consent, super fun. It is a non-negotiable legal requirement. Yes, even if you're on the other side of the world, you absolutely need recorded consent of anyone who is identifiable with the a few exceptions, but you need to speak to your legal team as to what you are comfortable with those exceptions are. One might be street scenes could be considered fair game within reason. Uh, one might be if you're filming a massive group of people, like a school and there's 50 people there, do you need to get consent of everyone? Uh, yes, because they're children or there's ways to sort of do that as a group with working with local institutions. Or if you're filming one person and they 
inevitably become the star of the show, even if it's a general scene, then you need their consent. But rule of thumb is if someone is identifiable, they need to give their consent. Uh, how do you do that? Well, consent forms. If you're really smart, you'll get them translated. If you're really, really smart, you can use iconography to illustrate the terms of those consent forms. I haven't seen that done well, but I think it's a really interesting thing to do. Uh, can people give re uh, consent retrospect re retrospectively? Uh, officially? <laughs> no. Unofficially? Yes. Um, legal guardians can give consent, which is really important in areas where people aren't giving informed consent, but you might want to be mindful of what that consent actually means. It's quite hard to balance the negotiation of consent because you need to be very clear about where the story is going, where the implications of revealing something might be, but you don't want to scare them, you don't want to manipulate them. So you would talk to them quite transparently and show the positive and the negative. If they are disclosing something that they that you weren't expecting, depending on what it is, you need to kick that down your safeguarding pathway straight away. Uh, or you need to sort of ensure that the, I call it the duty of care trifecta. Um, with the projects, there'll be you, case study person or content designer, content producer, whatever you want to call yourselves. Uh, they'll be the project worker and then the person sharing their story. All three people need to be happy with that story. So it, it has been the case where both the person who wants to share their story and the, their project worker thinks it's great. And someone like me is going, actually, I, I don't agree. This, this doesn't feel right. And I don't think you should be putting yourself in this position. Um, sometimes people might make claims, particularly in the UK, where you can't really back up what they're saying. So they might say, my dad did this to me, uh, almost definitely that identifies the dad. And if there's no legal uh, justification for making that, you might have to sort of fudge it a bit and say someone in my family. Otherwise, you can get a lot of trouble for uh, defamation. So it's better always to play it safe than jeopardizing someone. And, and that can be a real risk to life as well. So be very sensible about that. Um, it should always be recorded, like I said, so you can film it and you can have thumbprints, but written are always better and always check with your legal team first. Who is in charge of consent is a GDPR minefield. Um, you've got your data processor, i.e. the person who holds that copyright can count as the data processor that technically they own the consent. But if you've hired them and you've given them international property and you're the organization, then you're probably the one that people are going to go to first when they're angry about a story. So you might want to be using that as some negotiation tactics when getting contracts and things with um, with your crew if you're hiring people in. And again, definitely make sure your legal team are involved in that. Uh, consent is not a contract. It can be revoked. People have the right to erasure as well. And that has to be honored. So if you have consent, store them properly, put people's names on it, uh, put it in a locked safe and key where it's all protected as any data should be and should be easy to find and retrieve if you need it. There's a sort of weird things around health settings uh, and what informed consent could look like then. Uh, if someone is often in hospital for a reason, for example, uh, giving birth, <laughs> so you, how do you get informed consent from them there? It's really about timing and if someone is very ill, you can, with consent of the people around them, film them and then ask for their consent afterwards and get them to fill it in once they're in a safe place. But if they don't say yes, you absolutely have to delete everything you have. Um, and again, it's very questionable if it's okay to ethically film first and ask uh, later. So you need an organizational policy and what it is that you consider fair. When it comes to consent, mess ups happen a lot and they really shouldn't. I've been in organizations where they've named anonymous people. I've been in organizations where the case study has gone on to commit a crime or PTSD survivors have had something that reminds them of their trauma played back to them. Uh, you can only control what you can, but control it as well as you can. I also really love this picture. I should say, 80% of these pictures are not mine, but I know the people who took them and they were on my shoots. So copyright point of view, please don't share this anywhere publicly. Power. This is, con this is really uh, zeitgeisty, I guess. Um, often, like I've said, your crew is an educated or Western or even white or white passing group of people. Uh, the people involved might have been told to participate rather than volunteered to participate. Uh, they might be reimbursed in a way that you, they're not allowed to be paid, usually for an organization, but they might be given a free lunch. So you need to be mindful of the inequalities and, equal, and sort of hierarchy that's at play, whether you want them to or not. And when it comes to what you can control or some of those things you can control, uh, your final production can tell a lot about someone and where they're from and enforce a lot of stereotypes. So, for example, who's speaking first can often set the power piece of an entire uh, production. 
what language you're using. A lot of places will dub over someone, but then they're not speaking for themselves. So I would argue that subtitles are always better. They also, like I've said, carry this sort of weight of translation. Uh, where is that person positioned? So you'd never have someone that you're interviewing on the ground and someone who, for example, is white higher up. That just doesn't happen. Um, and then having anyone off on not on equal footing within reason, this is sort of a very different picture in front of you, uh, is definitely a no-no. So you need to be very mindful of what your setup looks like. You need to ask yourself whose story is not being told. People do have a right to reply if you're doing news anyway. And where you can, you should have teachers and officials sort of saying something about the situation that you're in. There will be race dynamics at play. There will be inequality dynamics at play. It, it, there'll be teachers who are, and social workers who might carry this position of power that someone else doesn't have. Um, there might be false promises being made you know this story showing the story will change your life it doesn't i mean it, it very rarely does so you need to be very uh, transparent about where it's going and think about the motive that they have to share their story and then think about the final production music animation tone nothing is uh, apathetic everything has meaning uh, nothing can be victimy that's very distasteful now you need to be respectful in your copy you need to be very mindful of your language choices language is fluid it changes uh, you should never, where you can, unless it's there's small ways where you should, you should really avoid sharing surnames, again, identifying people, particularly with children. Uh, avoid that white saviour imagery, uh, nothing fake, nothing set up, never perpetuate a, uh, a stereotype and think if you're naming local people, uh, your sort of Western people who are involved in the story, you should be naming the local people too. Everyone is equal. Uh, a really good example of where inadvertently, I know a trip that wasn't mine that went where something went wrong was a, a story about a young girl who I think it was a water story, something around her, a new uh, water filtration system. And they, this beautiful girl who was really excited to share how water has changed her and her family's lives. But then because she'd been chosen by this film crew, uh, she was bullied as a result afterwards. And people were quite resentful of this sort of short lived fame that she had. Uh, so all of this has to be in the back of your minds at all times. There is a weight of responsibility there. Uh, so what makes a good story? I've stolen this off an old colleague who probably stole it off the BBC. The truth framework. Is it true? So if it's not true, don't share it because that's a terrible thing to do. Is it relevant? Uh, is it relevant to your organization's work? There's no point talking about food production if your organization is working on, I don't know, domestic violence. Uh, is it unusual? What about the story makes people go, oh, stop and read? Uh, is it timely? Why are you telling the story now? Like I've said, there's a news hook always on the agenda and you can think quite practically about what makes the story relevant now or even for a campaign. Is it a Christmas time and you need to get something a bit more emotive out there? And is it human? So a lot of charities will like to talk about, I've mentioned before, infrastructural change. That's not very human. So find the human face, find the human element to it and bring that story to life. Uh, a lot of these stories have, as obviously, a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, you can stop and I'll talk about that very quickly. Uh, at some part of this story is suitable. The beginning is more suitable for certain parts of your campaign or organisations and the end is suitable for other bits. Um, they can be long form, which is great because it's quite a nuanced story. And a good story lets you dissect a bit of nuance in a very simple way lets you become, lets you tell an empathetic story and, and, and sort of generates that emotional reaction that I've told to you before. You need to think someone somewhere needs to read this and what do we, what's that person going to feel having read it? This is very classic. You can Google these and get these anywhere. But what makes a good photo? Obviously, the rule of thirds. Uh, branding, that's a super interesting one. Uh, I was never really a fan of it because it stops it being used in a lot of places, like a lot of news organisations don't like branding in pictures. But if you can make it very subtle, like in the bottom left of this picture, uh, then it might work. And also this picture has a lot of empty space, so your designers will thank you for being able to put big old text on it. Uh, there's a difference between the reportage shots, so that sort of natural element, your documentary work uh, that you're taking versus a very pose shot like this one here with the surgeon holding the baby. Uh, where you can ignore the stereotype, what you can, you should never do the stereotype, but make very conscious effort to make sure your photo isn't reinforcing stereotypes.
And then just good practice is credits and captions. There is nothing worse than looking at a photo a year later and going, I don't know this is what this was. So always write a good, solid, lengthy description of what this photo is doing, why it's relevant to your organization uh, and who took it as well. Very important. I am putting one of my notes. Humanitarians of Tinder is a definite no-no. We don't do that anymore. Um, what makes a good film? Show, don't tell. Really important. Keep it visual. A lot of places will ask you to film in their really boring conference room. It has terrible lighting and it's super unexciting. The outside world is much better. Uh, and like a written story, you need to keep the story punchy and short and succinct. You can't have your audience thinking too hard. So the simpler the story, the easier it is to tell on camera. And where this is something that a lot of organizations have fallen down and I've learned the hard way. Always create your film for the outlet. Don't just create a generic film that will stick on YouTube because that is not a communications strategy. You need to think if it's going on you, uh, Facebook, I'm going to commit and make a film for Facebook. If it's going in an email, I'll make that film. I won't just make a general film about this place that I've been to once. Um, and then to emphasize any person who says I need a film, really think about it as an embedded asset to your project and not just a casual let's just have it in the bank for when we want to use it lots of your stuff will end up on the cutting room floor so be prepared to be quite sad about what doesn't make it into the film so what works for what best uh this is social media uh i'm not a social media expert so i'm sure a few people in the room are and might grimace Behind the scenes stuff works super well on social media. So this is one and a half different trips that I went on to Mozambique, the food that I ate, the hair that was getting done behind me in the scenes, people counting money, part of a cooperative, people feeding their pigs just before they were about to go on camera. You can be obviously very visual. Uh, you don't need to tell too much of a story because our users are, as we know of Instagram, are super quick and super, can't really pay attention for very long. Uh, quick punchy stats work really nicely. Animation can work really nicely. Gorgeous pictures can work really nicely. Anything that sparks a conversation can work very well on social media because you have obviously comments and people want to say something about what they've seen. Um, and where you can, you can ask people to do something in that immediate moment. Largely donate can and can't work depending on your organization setup, uh, but community, community building and photos that build that sort of community of, to your brand, uh, they will work really well. Media. I don't know why I didn't write media at the top of this. My PowerPoint skills are appalling. Um, what, none of this should be super surprising, but media loves a story and the story isn't always what you think it is. So it needs to be something new, something that you can contribute to an ongoing conversation, meets the, new, uh, the news agenda, or it's a positioning statement where you have come out as an organization and said X, and a lot of your stories will go on to support those statements. Uh, impact is super key. Stats are super key here. Celebrities. <laughs> Well, dying a death a little bit in this trade, as they should, uh, but can be used super wisely. Putting, oh, what was I on what? Pixie Lot in sort of an LGBTQ, uh, very weird organization didn't work at all. Someone like Freddie Flintoff talking about addiction works really well. So someone who has a personal engagement with the story that they're telling can work very well. Uh, these are super audience specific, these stories. What works for The Guardian will not work for Good Housekeeping. Um, and when I say nuance, something like, oh, this village now has this brand new thing, that's not really a story. So this village now has power is not a story. The fact that grandmothers are climbing up these massive uh, trees to sort of install solar panels, which is a thing in Kenya, that's a great story. Um, and the good news is a lot of newspapers can't really afford international story gathering anymore. So you can do some pretty decent deals with them to say, use our stuff uh, in return for some promotion. Um, fundraising, that's the obvious one, the one that people, a lot of cynics will uh, not like when it comes to story gathering, and I understand that, but and unfortunately, fortunately, money is the, a lot of the goal here. Uh, money is what matters. The story will, you think about a story that might raise the most amount of money, particularly when it comes to fundraising, because without the money, the work can't be done, and if the work can't be done, then there's a big void in how people get support. There are lots of in-country organizations when people are a bit skeptical of the big ones that you might know, uh, but getting money to them is quite difficult. Uh, holding them to account with that money can be quite difficult. So that's, and you have things like Kickstarter that does work. Again, you're sort of buying into a story there, um, but it's very micro. So the macro level, uh, they rely on these tools and they do work. And that's where the big guys can do the best work. It's not without its flaws for sure, uh, but they are super important. 
impact is massively important again to these stories you'll always have a central story of need and a tangible solution and then a part of that cold to warm acquisition journey with your supporter where someone either is looking for something to do so let's say Christmas time to donate or they've come across this story and they're reading more then you keep it very nice and simple you really hammer home the, the sort of need for people to help uh, and then at the end when they've maybe donated or they've participated you can give them all the, the good news stories you might do that towards some warmer supporters who have yet to participate to say oh this does work don't forget we do work um, so you have to really think about the journey arc there I think it is the most used part of story gathering, arguably. It's the most thorough when it comes to trips. It's the most output heavy. You need loads of different variations of content and you need to keep it simple. Uh, I've learned that again the hard way that the more complex the story, the bigger the problem, the less people feel that they can help. Um, which is why I say the, the wider campaign, the wider the audience, because <laughs> let's have an example. Domestic violence in Papua New Guinea, which is, affects 99% of women, illicit, illicits no to near to nothing in terms of fundraising and responses it's just too big whereas earthquake in nepal very easy to see how you could help and then what i haven't really talked about is recruitment and corporate so a lot of organizations might use this to sort of get more people in uh, it's very experience led that sort of storytelling uh, it's open and upfront about what it's like to live on the work on the ground it's very personal it's very inspiring it's really focused on the personal impact of you making a difference um, sharing skills is a really good way to sort of explain how you're helping as well but the same processes to gather these stories apply Ooh been talking for quite some time I thought this would be a lot shorter so final bit how do we tell stories today and I've put at the bottom because I don't really think there's time or scope to talk about the biggest question that's facing this sector which is how do you decolonize storytelling this type of storytelling has had a huge impact in terms of how people around the world are seen and it's not always good and uh, anything from celebrities to word choices have been hugely influential and there's a lot of that being dissected right now as it absolutely should um, and some of the ways I think that you can sort of challenge that and, and sort of work to better storytelling, more appropriate storytelling, is thinking about the people who you hire. Um, one of the reasons I stepped away from this work is I don't feel like I'm needed anymore because there are plenty of people, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, sub Southeast Asia, and the Far East who are perfectly capable of doing this work and can probably tell those stories a lot better than I could. There's a lot of citizen journalist models on our radar as a really good organization. Um, one of the things that you can think about is actually where your content is going. So traditionally we do a campaign, a lot of charities do at Christmas to a British audience. It generates a lot of money, uh, but actually a lot of money is not coming from England anymore. It's coming from global trusts. It's coming from Brazil. It's coming from uh, Pan-African organizations and private individuals. So maybe rethinking the channels and the outlets uh, and thinking more about your stories in the UK as brand positioning rather than fundraising. Um, being clever with your mediums, I think, is about making use of every possible format of storytelling out there. I've seen some really cool puzzles pieced together with professional footage, coupled with people's own uh, physical, as in they're physically telling their own story, whether that's comic or, uh, you know, we've seen on coronavirus right now, Zoom calls or child pictures. I think there's a migrant piece done by the Washington Post, which is one of the best uh, examples of multimedia and user generated content to tell a full picture of what it's like to travel from a go across the channel and come to England. It was phenomenal. Um, thinking about what COVID looks like, that's going to change how we do a lot of these things, because I don't think we need to fly over anymore, not only just for climate change, but like I've said, empowering people locally to do things, like I've said, using Zoom to do things. We know that people and mobile phones can now put together some pretty decent stuff, so maybe that becomes the future and would help risk assessment nightmares. And then just querying whether this group and this sort of sector needs to exist in the way it does at all. Um, on our radar, like I said, is a great way I think the place that does this really well and then even someone like the BBC in Pictures Africa is a really great positive storytelling of what life is like across the continent because obviously there's some very difficult challenging circumstances there but there's some great culture work uh, progress whatever you want to call it there's some phenomenal stuff going on uh, one thing I I'll end quickly is I haven't really talked about the UK um, telling stories on our doorstep I'm assuming everyone here is in the UK though that's very difficult because the needs are very complex they're very hard to articulate and the audience is actually very judgmental they're very quick to question and criticize and they would be for people abroad um, 
you know, if you're telling stories of poverty, but someone has a 60 inch flat screen TV behind them, that's a very difficult image for people to digest. Uh, how do you talk about people transitioning without mentioning the, you know, what they were born into? Uh, how do you talk about HIV AIDS when the first question almost every audience member has in the UK is how did you get it? Or social bullying when that person's probably going back to school? Or how do you leave a gang without having repercussions when you identify that person. So agency and power, I'd argue, is really nuanced here. It's not impossible. So it really is about empowering and making sure that they're safe to tell their story and prep them for what's about to come. And I guess the whole point of this piece is I just wanted people to understand that when it comes to storytelling in your content design, it's a lot deeper than you think it's gonna be because it's not just an image on a screen or a few words. It's not only a lot of work behind it, but there's a lot of people and their real lives involved in it. Um, so it's not just sort of this asset that you slot into a content template, but it's, it's a huge amount of ethics and people's lives can be on the line, but it's an amazing thing to do. So if you can do it, you should. And that is the end of my surprisingly lengthy talk. Any questions? <laughs>